Hi guys and welcome back to the next episode of Images Decoded. Well, if you remember yesterday we had started off with renal pathology and as I said that I'll be needing a total of three short sessions to finish off the images. So here we are on session number two of renal path. Also, I hope all of you are following the uh, daily scheduler of the trio classes that is morning 7.30 on the app that is with kickstart morning then afternoon three o'clock the fmg crash course and evening nine o'clock with the images decoded session on the youtube channel so this entire series goes on from monday to friday at the different time slots that i've told you Having said that, what are the things that we have to learn today? We have to learn a little bit about microscopic examination of the urine with one or two instruments as well that I'll be adding. And then we also have to talk about images of renal tumors. So let's begin without any delay. The first thing that I'm starting with are going to be the different crystals that you can find in the urine. One by one, we'll read all of them. And in the end, we'll do an entire summary table of the same. So the first crystal that we have is, are known as the cholesterol crystal. So as you can see, is there any stain applied on them? No, these are totally unstained preparation. And what sample have I taken? I've taken a urine sample. I'm seeing the urine sample under a microscope without any stain. So this is a cholesterol crystal. And how do I identify a cholesterol crystal? It's going to be always like a broken chip. That's the classical description of a cholesterol crystal. It always gives the appearance of broken chips. So how have I learned it? Chips are obviously unhealthy and very rich in cholesterol. So broken chips are cholesterol crystals. You can see those broken notched ends in every crystal. That's a cholesterol crystal. Coming to the next. What is a cysteine crystal? If you count the number of sides that a cysteine crystal has, it has six sides right so i've always learned cysteine as 16 so this happens to be the hexagonal crystal similarly for every crystal we'll have a certain mnemonic or a way of learning so it's going to be simple for us the third one that we have is a tyrosine crystal how do they look like you'll say they look like a bundle of thin needles that's what they are right They're, that's a bundle of thin needles that you see over here very pointed needles so tyrosine will remind you of thin that's how we've learned it tyrosine will remind you of thin so thin needles is tyrosine coming to the next image if i can enlarge it even further you can very well appreciate that these are also like needles these are also like a bunch of needles. So I want to call them also as thin needles, but there's a difference now. No stain was applied, but still they have a color. So are they pigmented? Yes. So if they are thin needles, which are pigmented, I am dealing with bilirubin. So remember, when you say tyrosine, that sounds like thin. So thin needles. Bilirubin also sounds like thin. So that is also thin needles, but bilirubin will be pigmented. Having said that, now let's move on to the next. Here we have crystals, which again, if you want, I can zoom in for you. In these crystals, I see these classical thorn-like projections coming out, right? These thorn-like projections are known as apple thorn projections. So we call them A for A. Ammonium biurate crystals are showing you apple thorn projections. So apple thorn projections are ammonium biurate crystals. Coming to the next, here we have a crystal. I personally feel it always looks like, uh, you know, the uh, bark of a tree, right? So it's got those lamellations, the cut surface of a bark of a tree. It's got those lamellations. That's exactly how I describe them. When I see L4 lamellations in a crystal, I call them leucine crystals. L for lamination, N for leucine. Now coming to three calcium varieties. So as I can see, one is calcium carbonate, one is calcium oxalate, dihydrate, calcium oxalate, monohydrate. So when I look at calcium carbonate, it is round, round like a wheel. It's round like a wheel with got, it's got those striations also of a wheel. So can I say it is round and it has got striations. So when I look at it, I'll always think of a wheel. And that's how I've remembered when I'm talking about calcium carbonate car, it should remind me of that wheel kind of a shape. Now I see both of these next two are calcium oxalates, but one salt is calcium oxalate dihydrate. One is calcium oxalate monohydrate. The monohydrate one is looking like a dumbbell. That's how we describe it. The calcium oxalate monohydrate is a dumbbell shaped crystal. 
whereas the other one that I'm seeing is looking like an envelope. So the calcium oxalate dihydrate is an envelope shaped crystal and they ask you, you know, in the exam, you can always get confused. So remember, D is not for D. Dihydrate is not dumbbell shape. Dihydrate is envelope shape. Monohydrate is dumbbell shape. So whenever you get confused in the exam was di the dumbbell or mono the dumbbell. Remember, D and D cannot be kept together. D is not for D. So guys, with that, one last crystal left under this series and that is the uric acid crystal, the one that you'll find in the urine of a patient of gout probably. So you see that it can get such weird, weird shapes. One is looking three-sided, uh, one is looking a little convex, then this is looking like more like a rhomboid. So I can have lots of shapes that can come under, your, under a uric acid crystal. Rhomboid, they can also be like a parallelogram. They can also be prism shapes so lots of shapes how have i learned it u for universal it can have any kind of shape in the universe so uric acid becomes a universal crystal well having said that we studied all the crystals that you have to know and i can probably give you a very quick recap of all the crystals that we studied so with one more that I'll be adding in exactly, uh, you know, a minute. But first, let's finish off all our mnemonics. So first, if you remember, guys, we were studying the six-sided one, the cysteine crystal. Then we had the thin needles, so tyrosine. If those thin needles become pigmented, it becomes bilirubin. If I have A, A for apple thorn type, ammonium biurate. If I have universal shape, it is uric acid. If we have chips of cholesterol, so cholesterol crystals. If we have laminated like a tree bark, it is leucine. Then calcium carbonate will car, will the wheel of a car. Calcium oxalate dihydrate and monohydrate. So di is not dumbbell. D is not D. Di is envelope shape. Mono is dumbbell shape. The one last that we are left with is the triple phosphate or the struvite crystals and they tend to have something known as the coffin lid appearance. That's again a very famous one that you study in the exam. So I'll write it down for all of you. It shows me the coffin lid. No mnemonic for that. You just have to learn it. Coffin lid appearance. So you'll see a crystal and you'll see a line going through it. That's a coffin lid appearance. Triple phosphate, fancy name, struvite crystals. Done with the crystals guys. Now we can safely move on to the different type of casts. So again, I'm going to come to all of these one by one. And the first cast that I have is known as the hyaline cast. Now this probably is one of the most important out of this entire list. Why so? Because this is a totally normal finding of the urine. So can you see these transparent cylindrical structures? Totally transparent and cylindrical. That's how you define a cast. What is the shape of a cast? A cast is cylindrical in its structure. So how is it cylindrical? So why is it normal? What is it made up of? So if someone asks you the composition of a cast, it is made up of tam horsefall protein. And from where in the kidney is this protein secreted? From the loop of Henle. So imagine in the kidney from the loop of Henle, if a protein is getting secreted, what shape do you think will it take? The loop of Henle. Obviously, it will come out as a cylindrical shape and that is why it's come out like this. So is it seen in a totally normal person if I see one or two hyaline casts in the urine and the patient has no clinical symptoms, nothing at all? I'll consider it, I'll just let it pass by. It's a normal thing. Otherwise, if the urine is very concentrated, patient has dehydration, then also this can be seen under conditions like fever and physiological conditions like pregnancy. So overall, nothing to worry about. Either it's normal or lesser water intake, fever or pregnancy. Now, my concern is not when I see the hyaline cast. A transparent cylinder coming out in the urine is actually not of my concern. But along with this, if someone's sticks on top of it, some cell is sticking on top of the cylinder and coming along with it, then I do get worried. For example, it's the same Tam Horsfall protein, the same hyaline cast, but now what is stuck on top of it? 
red blood cells are stuck on top of it. Now am I going to be worried? Yes. Now I see an RBC cast which I see in a case of glomerulonephritis. So like I said till the time you're seeing a transparent cylinder life's good everything is fine but now when you start seeing something sticking and coming out that is RBC cast definitely a matter of worry. Having said that, moving on to the next one, here I have again that simple cylindrical structure but now I've got cells with a nucleus on top of it, cells which have nuclei. What are these? White blood cells. So when do I see a white blood cell cast? I see it in a chronic pyelonephritis. I hope you remember what we studied for chronic pyelonephritis yesterday at 9 o'clock. We had studied the thyroidization of the tubules and how the kidney is scarred. Now I'm telling you what will the urine examination of a WBC, you know, of CPN show you? Urine examination will show you a WBC cast. Coming to the next, this cast is looking Again, yes, cylindrical, but it's looking pretty brown and dirty. So we call it a muddy brown cast. Imagine someone's urine is showing you muddy material. Why? Why is the urine becoming so dirty, muddy, brown? Because cells must have died. This is seen in a case of ATN. What do we mean by ATN? ATN stands for acute tubular necrosis. See the word. What is dying? Yes, something is dying. Necrosis is happening of the tubular cells. So can I say what is coming out in the urine are all dead cells? The dead cells are coming out in the urine and dead cells are not going to be good looking for obvious reasons. They give a very dirty appearance to the urine. Muddy brown cast is seen in ATN. Coming to the next one. This cast probably doesn't show me, it shows me something that yes, there is some dot 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 material on top of it, but no cell properly, right? Because this is known as a granular cast. This is known as a granular cast and this just indicates that maybe this was earlier having some cells, WBCs, RBCs or some cells, but all those cells have degenerated now. So this basically indicates some kind of a degeneration of a old caste of an old caste that has happened. Coming to the last one that we have is a broad waxy cast. So you can see compared to the others, this is broader and it's kind of broken also. So please remember this is the cast of chronic renal failure. A very important question. They ask you this in the exam. What is the cast of chronic renal failure? It is a broad waxy cast. So repeating all the five, six casts that I have taught all of you in a quick, uh, you know, review. The transparent one which is usually normal is hyaline cast. If you have red blood cells on top of it, RBC cast. White blood cells on top of it, WBC cast. If it's all degenerated, it becomes a granular cast. If it's all dirty and muddy, it becomes a muddy brown cast. And if it is broad and broken, it becomes a broad cast. Well, having said that, the casts and the crystals are done. Now I want to discuss with you two or three images pertinent to the instruments. Two images predominantly that come. I think they also come in all the second year students who are going to appear for VIVA exam. This is going to come for you as well. This is known as an SBAX albuminometer. So no points for guessing that what is it going to do? Meter. Meter means measurement, metry. Meter means measurement and what is it going to measure? It's going to measure the amount of albumin in the urine. So what do I do? I fill the urine sample till where? There's a labeling known as U. So till U, I fill up the urine sample. Till here, I'll fill up the urine sample. After that, from U to R, I see an R labeling over here. R means reagent. So till here, I'm going to fill the reagent now. So till here, I fill the urine sample. Then till here, I fill the reagent. And now you're going to tell me what is the reagent. So no points for guessing again that the name of the reagent is kept as SBAX reagent. So the question is not going to be that simple. What is the composition of SBAX reagent? It comprises of citric acid as well as picric acid. So why are we only keeping acidic things in the reagent? Why not alkaline? Because I want the urine to become acidic. If I want the protein 
to coagulate and I want the protein should settle down at the bottom, I will have to make sure that the urine is acidic. Only then will all the protein settle down at the bottom and then can you see numbers here? I can see markings, right? Then I can measure that amount of protein. So for the protein to settle down, I need the pH to be acidic. That's very, very important. So what have I done? I've added citric acid to it. And why have I added picric acid? Because my chemical reaction says that albumin, if albumin is present in the urine, if it is there, it will combine with picric acid and it's going to give me a complex that is known as albuminopicrate. It's going to give me a complex known as albuminopicrate and this albuminopicrate is what is settling over here and that is what I measure. So if I want the albumin to settle, I have to make it react with picric acid and in which pH will it react? It will react in an acidic pH. So what is the name of this instrument? Espax albuminometer. Coming to the next, we also have something known as a urinometer. Now, urinometer, again, no points for guessing that I'm measuring something in the urine. But what am I measuring? I am measuring the specific gravity of the urine. So now, guys, you can see that there's a tube over here. And th these are the two parts separately. And then these are the two parts which are combined. So this is the tube in which I'm filling the urine sample. You can see over here the urine sample is filled. And then you see this kind of a structure. So this is a very thin thing known as a stem. It's a very thin stem and it's got all the markings. So this is where with which I'm going to measure the specific gravity. Then this broad thing, this is known as a float. And then what I have over here, if you've ever held it in your hand, this is quite a heavy thing because this is a mercury bulb. This is a mercury bulb and that's why it's pretty heavy and I want it to be heavy. Why? Because I'm going to first fill this particular tube, three-fourth of it, I'm going to fill it with the urine sample. After filling it with urine sample, I'm going to take this urinometer and I'm going to drop it inside it. Am I just going to throw it inside it? No. I'm going to throw it. While throwing it, I'm going to spin it around. While throwing it, I just twist it a little. So this is going to go more in a spinning motion so it obviously when i spin it this mercury bulb is very heavy so this all together is going to go right till the bottom can you see the mercury bulb has gone right till the bottom and thereafter do you remember your principle of buoyancy in which you were taught that if this urine has a lot of solutes if it has a lot of proteins and sugars and if it has a lot of solutes is it going to push the mercury bulb and this material or this instrument up yes there's going to be an upward thrust that it is going to give this is first going to go all the way down and then depending on the solutes it's going to rise up so that's an upward thrust that it's going to get how much of it has come up i'll be able to read over here from this marking and this marking will tell me the specific gravity so basically this was the usual principle that we used to study in school right the principle of archimedes and buoyancy and so on so exactly my point if the solutes in the urine are going to be more that is the specific gravity is going to be more the upward thrust and the upward movement of the uh, urinometer is also going to be more so if there are more of proteins in the urine more of sugars in the urine more of solutes this is going to be pushed up so I'll be able to measure the specific gravity accordingly. So the two instruments that you get in the exam, the one with the U and the R marking, if there's a U marking and there's an R marking, then you're dealing with SPAX albuminometer. If there's a urinometer kind of a mercury bulb, then you're measuring the specific gravity. Having discussed this, we are done with the casts and the crystals as well as the instruments. Now let's quickly move on to something to do with renal tumors. Well, all of you know that the images of renal tumors are just two or three, but the theory is really important. In case you've not attended the theory earlier, already a kickstart morning session has been conducted on the same and I'll want that you guys should go ahead and look into it. So, I'm going to talk about the tumors and first I'll start with the benign tumors of the kidney. In the benign tumors of the kidney, the first one that I have over here is an oncocytoma. And what do I see in an oncocytoma? What is the color? Firstly, oncocytoma, oma, it's a benign tumor. What color do I see? It's a very, very classical color which goes by the name of mahogany brown color. 
Now, if you guys remember yesterday also, I taught you something called mahogany brown. Yesterday, nine o'clock when we were doing images decoded, some appearance of the kidney on which I was putting a special stain and seeing a mahogany brown color. So there are just two mahogany browns in pathology. One is the oncocytoma in front of you, and the other one is that mahogany brown, which all of you are going to type out as homework today in the comments below. So I'm watching out for that, and I know you know the answer. So I just want you to revise. Okay. Okay, so in oncocytoma, I see a mahogany brown color and here in the center, I see something known as a central stellate scar. I see something called as central stellate scar and that becomes our next important question. So mahogany brown, you are going to tell me that where else do I see it? Central stellate scar, where else is it seen? I'm going to tell you. So when they're talking about the kidney, central stellate scar is an oncocytoma. When we are talking about the liver, there are two conditions, focal nodular hyperplasia for our second year students who have not read liver as of now, there's focal nodular hyperplasia. Next, in the liver, there's a type of a tumor of the liver known as fibrolamellar carcinoma. That also shows you stellate scar. Then when we are talking about the pancreas, when we are talking about the pancreas, in the pancreas, we have serous cyst adenoma of the pancreas and when we are talking about the breast in breast tissue we have radial scar so every organ has its one one thing right in kidney oncocytoma liver has two things fnh and fibrolamellar carcinoma pancreas is serous cyst adenoma breast has radial scar all of these have a central stellate scar so that was the first tumor oncocytoma what does the word oncocyte mean? Oncocyte means a cell which is very, very rich in which organelle? A cell which is extremely rich in mitochondria. So if you look at this black and white picture out here, all these organelles that you're seeing, all of these, so that's how we used to draw a mitochondria when we used to study it in school also, right? We used to draw these cristae and everything. So same, you can see those lines inside. These are all the mitochondrias. And that is the meaning of the word oncocyte. Oncocyte means something that is extremely rich in mitochondria. And yes, this tumor is full of mitochondria. And how does it look microscopically? You will clearly agree with me. It looks very, very pink. That's how we describe it. It is defined as a dense pink granular cell. That's the description of an oncocytoma. It is dense, it is pink and it is granular in appearance. Again, you'll ask me why is it dense, pink and granular? Because it contains a lot of mitochondria. That's why it's very granular, very, very pink. So repeating, oncocytoma. Oma tells me that it's benign. Oncocyte tells me that it's going to have lots of mitochondria. It's going to be very, very pink. It's going to be very, very granular. What else does the color have? Mahogany brown color with central stellate scar. The first benign tumor is done. Now let's move on to the second benign tumor. That is AML. Now this is not the blood wala AML. This is not the leukemia. This is AML having three components. Angiomyolipoma. Angiomyolipoma is very commonly associated with a syndrome that is known as tuberous sclerosis and uh, these tumors also happen to be HMB45 positive. I know that's going into a little bit of theory but that is how we always correlate and learn. So what does AML show me? So I have to find out three components in this tumor. I have to find out angio and myo and lipoma. So do you see the first component staring at us? This is a huge blood vessel. Lots of, what are these? These are lots of red blood cells. So is my angio component found? Yes, angio is done. Then I see all these white, white looking empty cells. So these white, white looking empty cells become the fatty component. So they become the lipoma. And then do you see all these spindle, spindle cells? They become the myopart. So have I found my angiomyolipoma? Yes, it's a triotumor all within one in the kidney. And this will be what positive? HMB45 positive. So your benign tumors are done. Now we are moving on and going further to study the malignant tumors. So the most common malignant tumor that we have in the kidney, the most common one, C for C, is clear cell RCC. Now when I say clear cell RCC, the cell is supposed to be extremely clear. So you can see all the cells out here are clear. 
and even over here if you see i've zoomed in for you they are looking completely white so yes you'll see the presence of extremely clear cells and then you will be asked why are these cells clear what is the reason so do they contain glycogen yes do they also contain lipid yes so do you know any stain for glycogen of course we do we all are experts in this stain for glycogen is pass and the stain for lipid happens to be oil red o so is clear cell rcc positive for both pass and oil red o yes it is having said that now let's move on to the next one and this is the one that we have known as papillary rcc i think two things are very obvious it will show us papillae and have we studied that any papillary tumor apart from showing you papillae will show you samoma bodies i think that's a question which we've studied so many times in general path any papillary tumor shows you the presence of samoma bodies so first when you look at these finger like projections these finger like projections are nothing but papillae next when you see this blue color round and round body this blue color round and round body becomes the samoma bodies it is nothing but a case of calcification right it is nothing but calcification before i proceed i know it's been a while that we discussed general path under images decoded i mean we've moved on towards episode 8 9 and so on so it's been a uh, almost more than 2 weeks that we did this so what is the mnemonic that we study for all the tumors and all the conditions showing me samoma bodies so guys samoma bodies has a mnemonic p s m square so this means there are going to be two p's there are going to be two s's and there are going to be two m's p s m square so p stands for all the papillary tumors that one can think of in the body all the papillary carcinomas be it the papillary carcinoma of the thyroid be it the papillary carcinoma of the kidney papillary carcinoma of the lungs of the gi tract of you know say colon for example endometrium no need to learn basically papillary carcinoma thyroid you definitely get a lot of questions but basically papillary carcinoma i just say simple things everywhere in the body okay coming to the next the next p is a prolactinoma pituitary tumor prolactinoma s stands for somatostatinoma somatostatinoma okay then the next s stands for the serous ovarian tumors of the ovary obviously serous ovarian tumors so serous ovarian tumors show you and this can be of both categories the benign category also and the malignant one also so remember serous ovarian tumors of the benign category and of the malignant category coming to the next we have 1m which stands for a brain tumor that is meningioma and we have 1m that stands for a lung tumor and that is mesothelioma so well having said that as i said the mnemonic for this happens to be psm square and a very important one how did i use it over here any papillary carcinoma shows us samoma bodies what's the third tumor that we have again image related chromophob rcc whenever i say chromophob rcc a big smile should come to your on your face because this is the best prognostically the best tumor prognostically this is the best tumor right so now what do i see in a chromophob rcc i see very interesting cells and they are labeled as plant cells that is how we call them they are referred to as plant cells and how do i define plant cells a plant cell has well defined outlines just like we used to draw it in school remember we used to make those plant cells and we used to make very nice with our pencils in our practical file we used to make an outline so plant cell looks exactly like that well defined outline if you see the nucleus it's very very dark so it has a raisinoid nucleus raisin is kishmish right so raisinoid nucleus and just the area around the nucleus is light there's a perinuclear halo now that's a confusion many students have see guys in clear cell rcc everything is clear everything is white entire cell whereas in chromophob rcc only the area around the nucleus is clear there's a perinuclear halo and what are these cells known as they're known as plant cells what is the special stain that they are positive for they are positive for hales colloidal iron so the halo cells are positive for hales colloidal iron you can see the beautiful blue color that has come to them 
So, well, these are the three adult tumors. The clear cell, which is totally clear, chromophobe, which is the plant cell, and papillary, showing you some oma bodies. So, what is the tumor that you have in children? The kidney tumor that we have in children is the triphasic Wilms tumor. What do I mean by the term triphasic? Obviously, three things it's going to have. So, number one, it has epithelial component. It has an epithelial component, number one to begin with. Number two, it has a mesenchymal component. So, that's what a mixed tumor is all about, right? Number one, there'll be epithelial component. Number two, there'll be a mesenchymal component. And number three, there's going to be something known as a blastimal component. And that is the reason, so that's what it has. It has blastima. That is the reason that Wilms tumor is also known as a nephroblastoma. Wilms tumor is also known as nephroblastoma because it has blastimal components. So how do I identify? What are the epithelial things that we have in it? So when I'm talking about epithelial things, uh, epithelial means something like a glomerulus or something like a tubule. So it was an attempt to form the glomerulus but could not form because it's a tumor. It was an attempt to form the tubule but could not form a tubule. So I call them abortive glomerulus and abortive tubule. So over here, for example, this round structure was an attempt to form a tubule. This round structure is an attempt to form the tubule. Maybe this cluster was an attempt to form the glomerulus but that that attempt or that mission has been aborted. So you call it abortive glomerulus, abortive tubules. That's the epithelial component. What is the mesenchymal component? So the The mesenchymal component is going to be all these stromal cells. All these stromal cells are the mesenchymal component. And what is the blastimal component? Blastimal component B for B. Blastima is always the blue color cell. So all these blue color cells that you have, that happen to be the blastimal component. So well, that is why we call it triphasic. Why is it called triphasic? Why is it called triphasic? Because it has three components, epithelial, mesenchymal as well as blastimal. So guys, with that, we come to an end of the second part of our images decoded for renal path. And tomorrow we are going to meet for the third part of the images decoded of renal path. And in that, we are going to talk about the different types of nephrotics and nephritic syndrome. So part three, nephrotic and nephritic syndrome tomorrow. Apart from that, our trio classes are also ongoing. But tomorrow morning, 7.30, there's no class. So just so that you don't keep waiting. But rest of the schedule follows as it is, right? Thank you so much much for joining in these all these classes the trio ones that i'm talking about are free for everyone to view and for those who are interested for the plus subscription these are the various subscription plans and offers that are available nowadays thank you so much for joining in guys good night and see you tomorrow with renal path part three